Good morning. My name is Huda Mahmoudi and I'm the holder of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. Um, we are situated in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences and uh, it is really my privilege today to have this uh, honor to introduce our speaker because she's a very good friend of mine. And uh, when I heard that she was coming to the U.S. and was able to spend a few days in uh, this area, uh, of course we decided to snatch her and see if we could have her come to the university and make this presentation. So, um, thank you very much for coming across the oceans and uh, agreeing to do this. Um, the other issue that is interesting today is that the chair, since my coming to the University of Maryland, has never uh, covered the issue of health care uh, in, in terms of disparities, in terms of what needs to happen with health care if we are talking about a world that we would like to make better, a world that we would like to improve, a world in which we'd like to get uh, rid of some of the major inequalities that present so many injustices. So uh, it's also very nice then to have her uh, be the first to speak on this topic. I think when it comes to entitlements, uh, there are several areas that everyone should be entitled to. And I, I've listed just some, but I think some of the most salient, salient ones are uh, either everyone should be entitled to food, to education, to shelter, and then of course to health, to access to health. And unfortunately, this is simply not the case. And so the, today's lecture really addresses this challenge. Um, Dr. Teki, as you have probably read, is a, a doctor, a physician. Uh, and she will tell you more about what she does on a daily basis, but you will get a sense of uh, the challenges that she faces every day in uh, relation to serving her patients and trying to give them the best possible health care that is possible given the circumstances. Um, <clears throat> so we are really delighted that she's able to do this for us. Dr. Teki is a specialist physician working in Johannesburg, South Africa. She has, a, has fellowships in nephrology and internal medicine and an interest in critical care. She is affiliated with the University of the Witwatersrand and currently practices medicine at the Chris Hani Bragwanath <coughs> Academic Hospital. I had to practice those a number of times and I still haven't done very well. Um, the hospital is a very large public hospital um, that <clears throat> serves approximately 6 million people from Soweto and the southern parts of Johannesburg. So you see the scale of, of what she is confronted with. Her current research interests are in the areas of lupus nephritis, critical care nephrology, the psychosocial issues compounding the care of patients with renal failure in a resource-limited setting, and the provision of effective palliative care to patients with end-stage renal failure. She is also interested in the forces of community building in society and the central role of moral education in this process. So it is really with great pleasure that I introduce you, Dr. Gloria Teki. Thank you very much. Thank you for that kind introduction, Huda. <laughs> um, and thank you all for coming to attend this talk. I'm privileged to be able to give a talk in this setting to academics such as yourselves. Um, so before I start, I just wanted to mention that I'm very much a downstream doctor. So it's sort of looking up at the issues and the problems rather than knowing the up-down approach, which probably a lot of you know better than I do, in terms of um, 
what should the what what should it look like? What should healthcare systems look like? So what I'd like to do today is to share with you some of my experiences and just sort of through the lens of a doctor working at the grassroots level and see how those maybe fit into some of the issues around medicine and provision of medicine on a bigger scale in a global setting. I'm also a Baha'i and many of my thoughts and reflections have come from study of the Baha'i writings on community and community building processes. Um, so in terms of this talk, um, that's the entrance to my hospital and I'll tell you a little bit more about it as we go along. Uh, what I've done is I've, I've divided it into two parts. One is the context where I get to tell stories about my hospital and what it looks like and what we do. And then the second is maybe just some reflections that might have a broader uh, appeal or interest um, that maybe will open up some discussions and I'd obviously look forward to hearing the thoughts of the audience and what, um, how that relates. So. Um, just to start, this is Johannesburg. Um, in case you haven't visited, put it on your bucket list of places to see. And Soweto is, um, Soweto is a part of Johannesburg. Soweto is Southwest Township. And what the townships were under apartheid law was a way of segregating the workforce, the black people, it's keeping them close enough that they could come and work in the big city, but keeping them separate. And so this township developed, and it's a huge township. Um, I'm not sure if we know exactly how many people live in Soweto because it's a very kind of fluctuant community with people coming in and out. But probably around four, four and a half million people live in Soweto on, on the southern sides of, of Johannesburg. Um, it has areas that range from, from quite well-off areas where people have built homes and so on and businesses now. There were, the black people were not allowed to have businesses under apartheid, so this area was very impoverished, very sort of kept back. You went to the, the white areas and then came back home to Baraguanas, to Soweto, sorry. But over the years it has developed and then there are still very, very poor areas in, the, in this area where there's informal homes, which we call shacks. Where, which, which house a lot of people. A lot of people still live in these conditions and it's one of the poorest areas around Johannesburg is, is Soweto. Um, but it has an incredibly rich and vibrant history. It's a very joyful place. It's a place where there's always music and there's always joy. And it's also produced a lot of very famous people. So uh, you've all known Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu and Trevor Noah who's now come to the States, a comedian. So they all have their roots and their history in um, Soweto. So it's definitely a place that has um, a rich history and has done a lot with what it has. Um, in terms of the hospital that serves this population and the southern part of Johannesburg, it's called Chris Hani Baraguanath Academic Hospital, but to, to most of us it's just known as Barra. So I could have let you off the hook, Dr. Mahmoudi, and let you call it Barra. Um, so it, it's a very large hospital. We're a little bit disappointed that we're no longer the largest in the world because two Chinese hospitals have taken over. <laughs> but we were in the Guinness Book of World Records and we were terribly proud of that status. Um, it, it's large both in terms of its capacity and in terms of its size. So it has 429 buildings and 10 kilometers of corridor. So by lunchtime, you've already done your 10,000 steps, so, <laughs> which is quite nice. Um, in terms of its inpatient bed capacity, it has 3,200 beds. To just give you an idea of the scale of that, Johns Hopkins Hospital has 951 beds, and I believe it's considered quite a large hospital in itself. So big hospital, a lot of people. And besides the beds, it has a very large outpatient facility. So 2,000 outpatients use the hospital every day for their care, for their different <coughs> concerns. It employs 6,700 staff. And as we said, probably four to six million people, but estimates have gone anywhere up to maybe seven, eight million. It's not clear on exactly how many people the population that Baraguana serves because it forms a referral unit for a lot of the surrounding areas. And 17,000 babies are born at Barra every year. Um, so the history of the hospital was it was built in 1941 and it was, it was essentially then later designated as the hospital for the black population. 
And so it had a very difficult beginning in terms of not having any resources and infrastructure and whatever was there. It was a, sort of this history of making do with whatever you have and making the most of what you have. But so along with this culture developed a culture of not turning people away. And that's quite a significant part of Baraguanath is that even if your beds are full, it's, it's very unusual for you to turn somebody away. Um, which comes with its own problems. I mean, patients being treated with chairs, having sort of mattresses on the floor and so on. But it is this culture of trying to give your population everything you have, which is, which is quite a, it's a nice place to work for many reasons, but especially for that. Um, the other thing is that it's, it has a, the public health care system in South Africa is free if you cannot pay or it's a very minimal amount of money. So this hospital essentially is available to anybody who needs medical care at any time. Um, and now where are we 20 years into democracy? Well, it's a big bustling hospital. It's also one of the main teaching grounds for the University of the Witwatersrand. Um, a lot of students go through here. A lot of people come to learn at Baragwanath. And um, yeah, it has, it has that sort of a, a culture. Um, of course, sorry. So that's, that's, that's what it looks like from above. And each of those long buildings is a ward. And, um, and that's what the wards look like. It's very unusual for them to be empty. So I think somebody took a picture when they were renovating or something. But, um, but you can get an appreciation for these long rows of beds. One ward will have about up to 60, 65 beds in it that is looking after patients at the same time. And um, so that, that's the structure of Barra. Um, of course, it's, it's, it has its challenges, and I wanted to maybe go through a few of the, of the main challenges just to discuss them and the experiences we have. Firstly, is, the, is it structural inequalities? I mean, these are historical, but they're still sort of sustained. And besides the the inequalities in terms of sort of the, the, that there isn't enough facility available. Also, we have this, this public-private health dichotomy, if you will, where we have a public health service that, that, that looks after the needs of most of the population and a private health service that looks after a more elite population, if we can call it that. And so our health care expenses, uh, expenditure per year is about 2 billion rand. Um, which I won't try and convert into US dollars. But just to give you an idea, it's about 8.5% of our GDP, whereas the US, I believe, it's about 17%. So we still have a long way to go with that. And secondly, of that 2 billion rand, 1 billion is spent on public health care and 1 billion is spent on private. And private looks after 16% of the population and public looks after 84%. So there's still a very big gap. There's still a big discrepancy, which is an issue that obviously there's an awareness, but we don't have the answers yet on how we're going to get back to a sort of a more just mechanism. Um, Nelson Mandela said in one of his speeches, one of the most challenged, um, he said, the greatest, sorry, the greatest single challenge facing our globalized world is to combat and eradicate its disparities. And I think, I mean, that, that's one place that we really need to start if we're going to move forward is look at how to combat and eradicate the disparities. Um, so that's one of the challenges. Another one is, um, is overcrowding. Overcrowding is a big issue for us. We're always at capacity. Um, there are large numbers of strain on limited resources. To give you an idea, internal medicine, which is a department that I work in, has some, somewhere between sort of 100 and 150 admissions a day. And it's not unusual for one intern with their registrar to be looking after 30, 40 patients at any one time. And that's sort of a, a, a normal number. It's not considered sort of, you know, excessive. So it's a lot of patients. And... Um, these are our statistics for the last several years showing the admissions which are increasing constantly as a hospital sort of becomes accessed by a whole lot more people. And the bed occupancy rate, if you look at 2014, you'll see that for nine months of the, of the 12, we were at a bed occupancy of over 100%. So, I mean, these are significant challenges. Patients also stay quite long in hospital. And the reason for that is because we have quite limited specialist resources. So if you're waiting for a surgical procedure or you're waiting for an MRI, you may wait several days. And so that increases the, the strain on the system. Um, 
So these are some of the factors. The other big thing is um, we have a significant burden of disease. We have a very diverse population with a diverse disease profile. And we're at the epicenter of the HIV AIDS epidemic. I mean, we, we really have taken the brunt of it in terms of, I think South Africa has the most cases of any country in the world. And we have 6 million people infected with HIV, which is a 17.9% population prevalence. So, I mean, this is, this is a real, this is a real challenge. It's a massive challenge. I mean, because with HIV comes its complications, both infectious and non-infectious. And in the, I mean, as an intern, if I look back 10 years ago, we didn't have drugs. So we weren't able to treat HIV. And so we would have, we were probably at that stage admitting about 150, 200 patients a day. But most of them, we could just put a Band-Aid on and try and keep them going and try and get them a little bit better and send them out. Um, and of those 150 patients, maybe 70 or 80% of them were HIV positive at that stage. We're in a bit of a better situation now because the ARV is that highly active antiretroviral therapy is available and it is, um, it is being given to the population free of charge. Um, and so 2.7 million of those 6 million have been able to access ARVs at this stage. And we're starting to see that they really work and it's made a difference. Which is, which is very nice for us. Um, we have a parallel epidemic, which is um, with urbanization and lifestyle change, we've seen a significant rise in diseases of lifestyle. So we're starting to see significant obesity. We're starting to see more diabetes, more hypertension, more coronary artery disease in a population that wasn't really affected by coronary artery disease in the past. So this parallel epidemic hasn't received enough attention and it needs to be our next area where we start focusing quite a bit of our attention. So these are our challenges. And um, there's analysts who have looked at Baraguanath and asked the questions, what sort of, what, what are the challenges and limitations, have always suggested that it's one of the most challenged hospitals in the world. It's one of the most challenged healthcare systems in the world. But they always go on to say something like, but somehow it works. And nobody actually knows why it works. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm going to give you a few of the positives, and maybe some of those will explain why it works. Um, it, it has a reputation for being a world-class training ground if you're a medical student or a subspecialist training, any sort of training, because of the, the amount of disease diversity, because of the numbers, because of the experience that you get. So we actually have waiting lists in a lot of departments of students from other countries wanting to come and do electives and to learn. And it's also a very good place for our students to learn. And the reason really is because we have, um, because we have limited resources, you need to make your diagnosis clinically. So there's a lot of sort of emphasis on sharpening your clinical skills. You can't just order a CT scan to see what's going on in the chest. You need to choose which patients would benefit from that CT scan. Um, so that, that's one of the values of it. Another one is this incredible sense of teamwork, but at all different levels. So you'll often see an intern pushing a patient in a wheelchair up to get their scan done because that's part of helping the patient. Or um, you'll call up a colleague in a different department and say, I really don't know what's wrong with this patient. And sort of three or four of you will meet around the bedside, look at the x-rays and sort of make a differential together or plan a treatment. It's not sort of you have to phone and get a consult and then there people come and then, you, you know, it's very much more, a, it's, it's very hands on and it's all about the patient and it's often around the patient's bed that, that discussions are had. And I think because of the numbers, because of the, the basic standards being so low, there's, there's still such an opportunity to make a difference. And I think this is something that a lot of healthcare practitioners crave is that to be able to say that I can actually help somebody. So that's definitely there. But for me, the big one is our patients. I mean, we just, I'm, I might be biased, but I think we have the nicest patients in the world. <laughs> so they really, they put on their best clothes to come to the hospital. They wait for hours. It's not uncommon to start off at five o'clock in the morning to come to see the doctor, wait several hours to get your file and then to see the doctor, and then wait at the pharmacy for the rest of the day to get your medication. And that's a standard sort of thing. So, um, so our patients are very patient. They really, they, they really come to, to the hospital and they trust 
their, um, their practitioners. They give you this sort of unqualified trust and they ask you, often when you want to give them options, they'll say to you, well, what would you do, doctor? You know, because whatever you would do, they're still happy with. And I think this is something that we can't take for granted because this isn't how medicine is in every part of the world anymore. And so we're very grateful for that trust that they give us. The other thing is that they have this incredible dignity in this. They, they, our patients approach the challenges of their lives with this stoicism and this dignity and this acceptance, which I think for me has been a remarkable lesson working in this setting. I think I've gotten more from my patients than they've gotten from me any day of that I've worked there. Um, and then just, I was looking to see, well, what are our sort of more tangible plus side? And um, so I just thought maybe I didn't want to go through too many of these, but if you look at the numbers of the more selected mortality indicators, we do seem to be going gradually in the right direction. Um, but having said that, it's probably better than, than what it looks like in terms of improvement because this is, the, this is the main portion of the HIV epidemic that you're looking at here. So between sort of 98 and 2013, a lot of those years we didn't have access to, to treatment and so on. So if you look at the numbers in between, there was probably quite a significant spike in mortality and now we're starting to come down. So we are making progress, but it's still very slow. And I, I toyed with the idea of putting up the US numbers next to it, but then it was just very depressing because they're sort of sixes and sevens and we're still at 32 and 40. So we have a long way to go and we, um, we need to keep at it. So um, just really to, to round up this section, um, I read a book that somebody's written where they've tried to analyze Baragwanath Hospital and why it works. And so this was their, their comment on, on Baragwanath and it was really this sort of dedication to the hospital and a belief of the people who work there and who, who use the hospital that of the, in the medicine. There's, there's this trust in the medicine that's practiced there and the ability of the staff to cope with it and even thrive on a very difficult workload and a huge patient load. So, I mean, that's Barra in a nutshell. Um, what we'll do as we go through some of the reflections is maybe just tell you a few stories along the way. But this is the hospital, this is the, maybe the context of, of where I work. Um, <clears throat> what I thought for the second part of this presentation was what sort of concepts would have broader application. And I couldn't really put them into a very sort of logical um, list of things. So what I did was I just took things that I thought would be of interest to us to discuss and I've made them into four little subheadings. Um, and I look forward afterwards, as I said, to hearing your thoughts and your experiences um, and maybe some solutions from you about the way forward. Um, so the first one that I put there was the concept of community and what does a community mean? This term was first used by Aristotle to describe a group of men with shared views. But it's grown and expanded and it's been redefined many times by many people to describe all sorts of things, that all sorts of, of interrelatedness of a group or a, of, of individuals. Um, so what I've put up here is a much more ambitious or visionary definition. Uh, this comes from the Baha'i writings and suggests what a community could look like. And for me, it was quite nice to sort of go through this quotation and think, how could we unpack community and how could we, what are the different factors that you consider in a community? So um, just to go through it, a community is a comprehensive unit of civilization composed of individuals, families and institutions. Um, working together with a common purpose for the welfare of people, both within and beyond its own borders. So it was this concept that it's not just about us, it's about the bigger picture, and um, that the important goals are to achieve unity in an unremitting quest for spiritual and social progress. So I thought that this was a very nice way to look at community and what we should strive towards in our communities. Um, so then the questions to consider in terms of a hospital were, what is, what is the hospital's role in the community? How does a hospital contribute to its community? Um, how do we address the health needs of each individual member of the community? How do we advocate for them? 
how do we empower them so that they can then take personal responsibility for their own health? How do we build their capacities as individuals to contribute to this community? Um, and it's the concept that the well-being of each individual is important to the health of the community and that the health of the community, that the individuals themselves have a responsibility to the health of the community. So what is the responsibility of the community to each individual and what is the responsibility of each individual to their community and to ensuring that their community progresses and advances and that their spiritual and social progress for, for all the the, the, the people that make up that community, and really both within and in the, in the larger context. Um, and how do, we, how do we, what does it look like for a com community be, to be responsible for its own health? You know, what does it look like for the individuals in that community to be informed and to be contributing to the welfare of their community? Um, one of the challenges that we've had at Baraguanath is because our community's voice has never been heard it's very difficult to start to, to, for them to start to, I mean, to, to complain or to ask for something and so on. And so that's something that's very important to progress as well. I often encourage my patients when there's no treatment available to go and ask for treatment, to go and lay some sort of a complaint and so on to say, we're worried, we're not getting our treatment, but they won't do it. They're still sort of, they're still very sort of afraid of, of that. But that's really the next step. That's the next step is what does it look like when um, the community itself takes ownership and starts saying, this is my health and I need these things to maintain it. Um, so I put a few examples in about Baraguanath and the concept of community. And the first one was several years ago, we had a nurse's strike and it was really one of the most difficult things that we went through in South Africa because the nurses who wanted to come to hospital were not able to because they were intimidated and there was a lot of violence in their communities. And so it, was, it left the entire system vulnerable and there was really nobody to care for these large number of patients at Baraguanath at all the hospitals in Johannesburg. And so what was amazing was that the army stepped in and they stepped in with exactly the right attitude like the military personnel came and there was nothing that they wouldn't do. There was nothing. If, it was, if they were required to feed a patient, if they were required to clear the bedpans, they were just, they were tireless and they really, I personally believe having been there and seen it, they made a huge difference to the mortality that could have resulted from this quite debilitating strike. So that was one of the things that really showed me how a community can have each other's back and look out for each other. We also have this concept of Nelson Mandela Day. So Nelson Mandela Day is a day that we take very seriously in South Africa. Every year on his birthday, everybody is encouraged to spend 67 minutes of time giving back to their community in whatever way that they would like to. And companies and individuals and everybody tries to find something they can do to give back to the community. The reason for 67 minutes is because it was 67 years of his life that he fought for South Africa. So the idea is that you give back 67 minutes to your community. And every year, all of these people come to the hospital from the surrounding community and they paint and they clean and they help look after the children in the wards. And it's an incredible sense of community. Um, we also have, in terms of addressing community and issues, the South Africa started looking at training specialists, subspecialists, medical students from other countries in Africa to try and uplift their medical systems. So many trainees come from around the continent, spend several years, go back to their homes as pulmonologists, as physicians, as surgeons, and take their skills back and their learnings back. So I think that's a very important sort of way of looking beyond the borders of one's own community to see what can be done for the, for, for the rest of the continent. Um, I was listening to the radio the other day and this gentleman phoned into the radio and he was telling his story of how he's a, he's a paraplegic and he, had, he, hadn't, he, he, didn't, he lives alone and he doesn't have anybody who takes care of him. And he, had, um, he, hadn't, he, he was in a very desperate situation where he said he hadn't eaten for five days and he hadn't bathed for ten days. He was just lying in his bed in his little informal home. 
and nobody had come to see him. So the reason he was phoning into the radio station was because he was so incredibly grateful that on Mandela Day there was a knock on his door and all of these people that he didn't know had come and they'd picked him up and put him outside. He hadn't seen the sun, he said, for many months. And they had really just cleaned his house and given him food and done all of these things. And so he was extremely grateful and he'd phoned in just so humbled by this gesture. And so they, the radio station decided to follow up with him and see where he was a week later and to see what they could do to help. And what amazed me was that they actually didn't need to do that much because the community had arisen to respond to this man's plight. So somebody had organized and paid for a person who would go every day to check on him and cook him a meal. And somebody else had donated a mattress and three blankets because his, his shack is freezing cold. And really, it was just this incredible sort of, everybody had thought, how can I help? What can I do? And so that was a nice sort of example when I was actually preparing this talk that I saw, well, we do have some community sort of spirit happening in Johannesburg in South Africa. And what's quite symbolic in Soweto in, in, at Baragwanath Hospital is that we have this bridge. And this is the Barra Bridge. And the Barra Bridge connects the community straight to the hospital. And so essentially you get off a bus or uh, um, any sort of a, a public transport system on that side of the bridge, you walk across and you're right in the hospital. You can visit, you can get care and so on. So I thought that was a nice thing because a lot of hospitals are quite remote for their from their communities. But this one is really right in the middle of its community and it's a part of its community, which is is quite a nice sort of thing. This bridge has just been renovated and it's got a, it's, it's, it looks much smarter now, but this picture was just a nice picture. So, I mean, we're doing some things, but we really have a long way to go. And we really have to sort of look at what the, what, what, how this concept of community can be developed and keep it in mind with everything. And I think this was a, a cartoon that was online. And I think this is an important thing to remember. I mean, we just can't be thinking about only our setting. I mean, in a globalized world, we all have a responsibility towards a cohesive plan to better the healthcare or all the other um, resource deliveries that are required by our, by our world. The next topic that I wanted to briefly talk about was acquiring knowledge. Um, and the reason I didn't call it education was because education sort of is a more bounded term than knowledge. And I think it's firstly this realization that there are so many diverse sources of knowledge. There are so many different um, ways that knowledge is, is, is available and is, is shared and um, so many different bodies of knowledge. So what I wanted to do was to start with by talking about scientific knowledge and Personally, I think this is probably one of the exciting times to be a doctor. And the reason for that is because we've got evidence-based medicine. We have research that guides our decisions as doctors. So it's not just that my grandfather prescribed this drug and it seemed to work well on patients, so I'll prescribe it. We actually have all this information. We have all this, this incredible, constant, growing body of knowledge that guides our decisions and guides our ability to treat patients. So. I mean, from the point of a healthcare practitioner, we need to constantly be responsible, firstly, in acquiring the knowledge that we need, and secondly, in contributing to that knowledge. And I think there's a realization that um, everybody has a responsibility to contribute and to benefit from knowledge. So audits, research, science, all of these things are things that, that, that we need to be busily involved with. Um, and then I think a second thing that I wanted to say under that was that it's, it's a realization that a person's not just a pneumonia or a broken leg. I mean, there's so much more that makes up this person sitting in front of you. And you can fix a broken leg, but if you haven't addressed the other issues, have you really done your job? And so it's an appreciation for all the other things that make up a patient, the socioeconomic considerations, the... Um, just their capacities, their beliefs, their attitudes, their cultural premises, all of these things have to be part of your consideration. Um, I just wanted to say a word or two about traditional medicine, because this is something I think that's relevant in many different parts of the world. Um, 
We have quite a strong culture of traditional medicine and herbal medicine in our population. And the population has a significant trust in the traditional healers and the, and the population that, that they serve. Um, like historically, the mainstream medicine, if you will, and the traditional medicine have always been at loggerheads. I think we see their mistakes, they see our mistakes, and we've never gotten along. And I don't know if, um, if that's any different anywhere in the world, to be honest. Um, but I think it's a realization that everybody is part of the whole. Everybody needs to come to the table and figure out what their role is because we're actually, our goal is the same. Our goal is if the person is front, in front of you with a problem is to solve that problem. And so just a small example of where that was very successful was in, um, in the north of South Africa. There was a group of traditional healers and they were consulted by a public health project and the public health project looked at these healers and said what can they do towards the HIV AIDS epidemic and towards the prevention of the spread of tuberculosis and to the treatment of tuberculosis. So they brought them in and they had consultations together and they all spoke about how, what the way forward would be. And they started this project where the traditional healers would encourage the population to get tested for HIV and to get tested for TB and to know what to look for for TB. And also their other role, which apparently was very successful, was we have what's called direct, directly observed therapy for tuberculosis, where somebody monitors your therapy to make sure you don't default when you feel better, to make sure that your treatment's working well for you without side effects. And the herbal tr herbalists and the traditional doctors took on this role so effectively and with such trust from the community. So, I think that this is something that we need to look more closely at because it hasn't happened until now. The other thing I wanted to say about acquiring knowledge is this concept of preventative medicine. How do we think upstream? How do we look and see? And so uh, I'm not sure, I think maybe you're all familiar with this example of the waterfall, but it's one of my favorites, so please indulge me for a moment. Um, so it's a description really of a waterfall and um, there's there's, there's, the doctors are sort of, or the healthcare services are standing at the bottom and everybody who falls in, who goes to have a closer look at the top, falls in, is sort of being fished out and resuscitated and put back together as best we can. Um, but we're not very good at making efforts to put up a fence at the top to make sure that people don't fall into the waterfall or even a sign that says, danger, please don't go this close because you'll slip and fall. So we're sort of fishing them out and saving the ones we can, but we're not doing our upstream work. And this can apply to so many different things. I mean, HIV is a classic example, you know, that we need to stop the spread of the disease. We can't just say, oh, okay, we'll just patch you up and put you on treatment and keep you going. We really need to have an upstream approach. How do we reduce the number of um, infections? The same with diseases of lifestyle. I mean, it's an, it's, I think this is something that America is very busily engaged with, is looking at how to reduce the diseases of lifestyle. So we can't just be downstream thinkers, even though for people like me, that's the most comfortable, is patch people up when they come to you and don't think about the hard questions. But I think that's an important area. And it's not an area that's limited to healthcare practitioners. I think this is an area where everybody else makes a much bigger contribution than we do on a much bigger scale towards keeping the population healthy. So those are a few things I wanted to say about acquiring knowledge. Um, and then equitable distribution of limited resources. I think that we're probably very well placed to be, say, to, to be talking about this as, um, as Johannesburg as South Africa. Um, and the reason for that is because we're somewhere on the continuum. I mean, if you work in a sort of a very rural setting where you have nothing, essentially you have nothing and you give whatever you can to whoever comes. If you have a less limited setting, you can give to most everybody. But we fall somewhere in between where we have all the first world meds and we have access to intensive care, to dialysis, to all of these life-saving measures but in limited scale because it's just too expensive and we can't afford to dialyze everybody that needs dialysis and we can't give beds to everybody that needs an ICU bed. To give you an idea, Baraguanath for its 3,200 beds has a 36 bed intensive care unit. 
And those 36 beds have to cover pediatrics, adult medicine, surgery, obstetrics, and gynecology. So everybody who needs a bed, essentially, needs to be accommodated. So it's a very limited resource. The same with dialysis. Dialysis is extremely expensive in South Africa. And so if we wanted to dialyze everybody who could benefit from dialysis, we could probably use up most of that healthcare budget very quickly. So the, the difficult questions arise. How do you decide who to give these resources to? Who, how do you share resources when they're so limited? And I think what we've always done as a medical fraternity is we've chosen the best possible candidate with the best chance of survival. And so we've left it at that. So if the, if the clinical side looks like this, then that's a person who will do better and you give the resources to that person. So for example, before we commit to dialyzing a patient in the state sector, we look at whether that patient is transplantable. Would they benefit from a kidney transplant? And would they have a good quality of life once you start them on dialysis? And then we make a decision. And then the next question is, do you have any slots available to dialyze this person? Otherwise, they join a waiting list, which is also quite difficult. But it's, it's those constant discussions and those constant questions. Um, the question comes in then, who should make these decisions? Because in our case, we have some support and guidance from our medical um, authorities who tell us these are the criteria, this is where you, you would admit a patient to ICU and so on, but it still falls a lot on the shoulders of the individual practitioner. My personal thought is that there would be quite a role in this case for an informed community, the patients themselves, the community at large, to be involved in making decisions on policy. I mean, is there room to consider other factors? For example, and I know that this is a thorny issue and I actually don't know what my own personal views are, but for example, if you have a mother of three who's 30 years old and she's the sole caregiver of these three children, should that come into your consideration of whether you're going to admit her to ICU or dialyze her over another person? But it's, it's, the reason I say it's a thorny issue is because then you start deciding which life is worth more than another and that's very difficult. So if that's something that you want to take on, I think you would need the community, you would need the input of, of many, many different people to make decisions like that. Um, but these are all really considerations around resource-limited settings. Um, the next question is, what do you do for the patients that you have to send away without life-saving therapies? Because that's what it is, it's life-saving therapies. And so what do you do? What do you do for the families? How do you take care of people when you can't? And for me, this is sort of a daily battle. It's a daily difficulty is, is, is to be able to look people in the eye and send them away. Um, so the question is, what do you do then? And I don't have the answers, but I think that the first thing is that you need to give more of your time and your care. Because what what we're guilty of as practitioners is, okay, I can't help, I can't fix it. So we sort of back off a little bit and we give them the treatment and hope for the best. But I think this is where you need to have those honest conversations. You need to have something in place for that family to take care of them. Um, we've recently started a palliative care program with the assistance of palliative care specialists and with, in fact, Rotary has come on board to help with this project to at least provide dignified end-of-life care in people's own homes, to give them support, to give access to hospice. It's not the answer, but it, it's at least it's, it's, it's a measure that can be put in place. Social workers go to the home of the patient, see how the family's coping, and really help them to come to terms with these diagnoses. Um, so, and I think also it's that constant looking at advocacy and making sure that we're doing that for our patients. Now my renal patients, these are the ones who are on dialysis in our outreach hospital in, in, our, um, in our hospital at Baraguanas, wanted to have their picture shown in America. <laughs> so now you can indulge them and you've seen their picture. <laughs> so I think really the only last thing that I wanted to say was this, I looked at sort of what are the qualities that are important to healthcare delivery to practitioners, to people. and. Um, and then I took out the, the main ones that we always talk about, you know, clinical acumen, patient advocacy. Well, patient advocacy I left in because I thought it was important. But, you know, that genuine regard for human life and so on. And then there were just three points that I wanted to make quite briefly. One of them is the concept of resilience or the ability to adjust to or recover quickly from 
um, challenging situations or illness. And this is a subject that Dr. Mahmoudi knows very well, having written an excellent paper on childhood, resilience in childhood. But really, I think that a hospital like Baraguan is only sustainable because of the resilience. But I mean, that's something to look a bit, a, a bit closer at. How do you create a resilient community and how do you ensure that everybody is able to function under those settings? Um, resourcefulness is another one. Um, I think that it's this whole concept of an innovative or creative approach to healthcare. Um, we got quite a lot of backlash a few years ago at Baragwanath when we had a baby boom. And you can imagine when you have 17,000 babies on a normal year, um, when it's suddenly there's a lot more, then you, you have quite a lot of difficulty finding places to, to put the babies. So they'd run out of cribs. And so what they did was they took cardboard boxes and they wrapped the babies up and they put them together for warmth. And it was a huge outcry about Baraguan. It doesn't care about their babies and so on. But what I've done is I've put a little Finnish baby on the other side because Finland has always known that cardboard boxes are good things. And they actually <laughs> send every mother home with a cardboard box to use as a crib because um, it reduces infant death, apparently. So... I mean, there's different ways of making a plan, and I think that <laughs> it's often something to look at. And then just a point on, um, on patient advocacy. As I said, our patients aren't there yet, so it's still quite a big responsibility as a hospital, as clinicians. But I think it should also be the responsibility of civil society at a bigger level. And this is something that's been quite effective in South Africa. As I told you earlier, we didn't have HIV treatment for many years because of its cost. And we had a group of concerned citizens, patients themselves, lawyers and so on, who actually took the government to court under the, 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 the premise of, of that it's a right, a human right for patients to be treated. It was called the Treatment Action Campaign and the Save Our Babies Campaign, which was incredibly successful. And as a result of that, we actually got antiretrovirals in the hospital. So there's more, there's a lot of room for everybody to come on board and to become involved in sort of as players in healthcare um, and a more unified sort of approach. So I think, again, to quote Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it's done. And that's what I have. Thank you very much for listening.